gracious Father, this song that we're just going to sing is truly, truly reflective of the desire that we have as we stand with our heads bowed before you. We thank you, Lord, that your eye is on the sparrow and that you watch over us. And each of us here, as we go through this worship experience, even as we leave this place and go about the new week that's about to begin, may we always be reminded that our God watches over us. The God who watches over us at this moment wants to speak to us. He wants to give us a word that will keep us until our next appointment with him. And so I pray, dear Lord, that your spirit, your Holy Spirit, may inspire not only the words of the sermon, but may he inspire the speaker so that the words that are spoken are only from above. Our burden as preachers is not to be heard in our own thoughts, but it's to make sure that Christ is heard, believed, understood, and followed. And so we pray that as we sit through this message, may we truly experience the love of God that can change all aspects of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say amen, amen. and amen. God bless you. You may take your seats. Uh, let me invite Sister Gloria to the stage as she will prepare our hearts to hear the message. Oh, 
rescued my soul to the one who has welcomed me home to the one who is savior of all i sing for ever to the one who has rescued my soul to the one who has welcomed me home to the one who is savior of all I sing forever Oh Jesus I sing forever to you Lord oh, oh, oh. With arms held high Lord, I give my life, knowing I'm found in Christ, in a love forever. With all I am, in your grace I stand, the greatest of all. God, my Savior, to the one who has rescued my soul, to the one who has welcomed me home, to the one who is Savior of all, I sing forever, to the one who has rescued my soul. To the one who has welcomed me home, to the one who is Savior of all, I sing forever. Thank you. Like I said last week, if you give me energy at the beginning, I will expect nothing of you through the rest of the sermon. Can you turn to your neighbor for a second and just say to them, God loves you and so do I? And then while you're still looking at them, say, please don't fall asleep. <laughs> Look, uh, trust me, I understand. Uh, I preach in the afternoon and I judge you, but I've sat in an afternoon service. I know what it feels like. Your eyes just want to take a break for the duration of the sermon, but just fight the urge, fight the urge. Welcome to the Power Up. This is our afternoon segment for worship services. We continually preach the word of God as often as we can, and we appreciate your presence. May God bless you for choosing to worship with us this afternoon. Uh, I think you can hear that something's going on. I'm gonna try to enjoy as much as I can. This is the final installment in this sermon series. Both Pastor H and myself, Pastor H is Pastor Henry, I'm trying to save time. We are trying to, uh, we were trying to work with this theme of love for the past three Sabbaths. This is the final one. And just as a, an announcement, next week as we approach the Easter season, we are going to be dealing with the seven words of Jesus on the cross. They are recorded in the four gospels, seven statements that Christ uttered while hanging on the cross that are so relevant and significant that we want to look at each one at a time and see what we can get, we can use in this day and age. So I encourage you, please come for both services as we will cover them for power hour and power up the seven words of Jesus. I believe the title of the series will be, uh, what did Jesus say? 
and then we'll deal with one at a time. Today, I'm concluding Love Inc. Love Incorporated. The first message we dealt with was uh, capacity. Capacity. The problem is not that God doesn't love you. The problem is that you don't possess the capacity to receive the love that God is willing to give. The problem with our time is we self-evaluate too much. This generation is so self-centered that we either think we are so great or we think we are so worthless. And because of that, people miss out on experiencing the love of God. Then last week in the afternoon, we discussed uh, conflict, that there's a problem. John tells us in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 to 17, the problem is that we love the world. And so therefore, if we love the world, it means we don't love God. We spend some time discussing what loving God meant. And it simply means allowing yourself to see the world the way that God does. Because if you see the world the way that God does, you won't love it anymore. But you will love the things of God. Today, after much thought and consideration, I'm going to go with this C word, currency. Currency. What is currency? Well, you all know me, I love the dictionary. Uh, something such as coins, treasury notes, and banknotes that is, that is in circulation as a medium of exchange. Basically, currency is the money that you use depending on the country you come from. Just to keep you awake for a second, I want to ask you, a question. Which is the strongest world currency in 2018? That is most definitely not a biblical question, so you don't have to look at me weird. Which is the strongest world currency? You are all wrong. The US dollar is number seven. The US dollar is the world reserve currency. That means it's used everywhere, but it is not the strongest currency. The strongest currency is the Kuwait dinar. How can you compare an oil country to the United States of America? The Kuwait dinar is the strongest currency in the world. It's an oil country, so of course it's gonna be stronger. And number two, number three, number four, oil countries as well. The US dollar is just more circulated. You can use the dollar anywhere. In fact, in 2009, my country, because it uh, won the competition of inflation versus Germany, World War II, we stopped using our currency and started using the US dollar, all right? But it is not the strongest world currency. Stop reading your Bibles and pick up uh, a newspaper now and again. <laughs> currency, why, why, why would I pick this as a title? Today's passage is Matthew chapter 13. Uh, you know I love you to, to read it with me before we get into the text. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, we're going to read verse number 45 down to verse number 46, 44 to verse 46. Matthew 13 verse 44 down to verse 46. Uh, interesting thing uh, I discovered lately, in fact I was uh, uh, probing Nick about this a few weeks ago, just asking about Bitcoin. I remember a few years ago, people were making fun of it. But uh, last year, some people seemed to be making money. Who knows? Maybe this is the direction we are going in. Uh, Lord have mercy if it is, but we'll see how it develops. But I want to talk about a different currency uh, today. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 13, verse number 44, down to verse 46. Uh, this is one of the parables of Jesus. Christ, in his infinite wisdom, being endowed with a knowledge beyond human capacity, did his best to explain the things of heaven in a way that humanity could grasp it. And so you can imagine as he's sitting down talking to the people, he wants to explain heaven to people who've never been there. And so he has to use analogies and similes and, and, and metaphors to make them understand things of divinity. And so he opens his mouth and says, the kingdom of heaven is like. That expression is found 32 times in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel is to 
Jews. And so you can understand that instead of saying the kingdom of God, like Luke or Mark would say, Matthew says the kingdom of heaven. See, the Jews were careful not to mention the name of God. And, and so it seems that in selecting a phrase to record, Matthew says, the kingdom of heaven. 32 times. But right now it's found in a parable. And verse 44 says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. Two of these parables are pretty much connected. Both of them deal with the value of the kingdom of God. But the worth and value of something is determined by the one who is willing to pay the price. For example, the most expensive tie in the world costs $220,000. The fact that it has a price tag means that somebody was willing to pay. Phil, I know you love ties, man. Would you pay $220,000 for a tie? Let me put it this way. I wouldn't pay more than $20 for a tie. But that tie has got diamonds and stuff on it. You want to walk around the streets of Jakarta with a tie with diamonds on it? It's not worth your life. But there's somebody that paid for that. The most expensive burger in the world costs $5,000. Now, I love burgers like the next dude, but I'm not paying $5,000 for anything regarding food. But somebody paid $5,000 for a burger because in their eyes, it was worth it. The most expensive engagement ring is $9.5 She better be the most obedient wife in the world <laughs> at $9.5 At $9.5 there is no wedding. There is no dowry. Your parents are not allowed to say anything about me until you die. But somebody paid. 9.5 million for an engagement ring because apparently it was worth it. Interesting fact about our generation. Our generation is so manipulated that we like things that other people like. We lack originality. For example, I won't wear a pair of shoes unless Kanye West wears them. I won't use a perfume until some female celebrity puts a name on it, as if they went to the jungles of Brazil and mixed the potion themselves. No, they didn't. They just put their name on it, and now you wear it. Kenneth Cole, Esther Lauder, those are the only two that I know. <laughs> we place value on something based on what somebody else thinks about it. If they like it, I like it. That's why when it comes to a pair of shoes, when it comes to jewelry, when it comes to makeup, when it comes to perfumes, if some celebrity endorses it, everybody buys it. But at the end of the day, it's all just chemicals and metals and elements of the earth that somebody put together. But worth is determined by the person that is willing to pay for it. In our passage today, we see the expression, the kingdom of heaven. I think of all the sections of the text that I spend more time on, it was just on that alone. For the longest time possible as a Christian, I have always assumed that when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven, he's referring to heaven. But when I look at the text, when I look at the parable, I'm thinking if that's talking about the, the glory land, if he's talking about the new Jerusalem, why is Jesus equating the kingdom to the actions of a man? And so it, 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 it baffled me for a long time. And I must say the answer came a long time ago. But reading the text again, I saw love in a text where love is not mentioned. If you noticed, the word love doesn't appear. Correct me if I'm wrong. Did you see the word love in this text? Yes or no? Did you see the word love? Do, do, do you understand the question? Okay. The, 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 the word love doesn't appear in the text. But according to context, I see the word love, and I'll show you why I say so. 
First of all, when you think about the kingdom of heaven, the way that Jesus, the way that John the Baptist, the way that the apostles use it, most of the time they're not referring to a place, but they're referring to an experience. Because God's intention is not that you live in the kingdom of heaven after you, 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 you go to heaven, but rather he wants the kingdom of heaven to be here. John the Baptist preached and he said, repent and be baptized for the kingdom of God is at hand. When Jesus came, he said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom is here. So the kingdom is not talking about something that you can touch and feel that is tangible, but it's an experience with God. So when Jesus is explaining the parable, he's thinking the kingdom of heaven is like, um, it's like, it's like a dude who finds gold hidden in the ground. So he explains a heavenly concept using earthly understanding. To summarize it, what I get about the kingdom of heaven is talking about the experience of salvation. It's talking about that transaction between you and God. The kingdom of heaven is not just a place. It's the experience you have with God and what you are willing to give up to get it. So it's salvation. The kingdom of heaven is the gospel, the message. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 4, the Bible says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Talking about the gospel message of Jesus, that's a treasure. The kingdom of heaven is encapsulated in the gospel message. The kingdom of heaven is also the grace of God. That kingdom of grace, that uh, unmerited favor that we receive when God accepts you even though you are a sinner. It's also found in the kingdom of of heaven. One more, the kingdom of heaven, of course, is eternal life. It's an insurance policy to life without end. And so if you experience the kingdom of heaven on earth, you'll be able to experience the kingdom of heaven for real. Amen, somebody. But if you're waiting to experience heaven later on and not now, you might not endure until the end. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the Bible says that God has put eternity in the hearts of men. That means he has placed this longing for something better than here in your hearts of men. And that's why last week I said there's a conflict in our hearts. We love the world so much that we don't care about preparing for the world to come. And true love for God means I am not content with the life down here, no matter how much possessions I have. I'm going to prepare myself, my kids and my family for the world to come. But today, the message is about currency. Let's, let's add currency to the text. When you think about a kingdom, what comes to your mind? You, you can talk to me. A king. What else? What else comes to mind? A queen. Eh, okay. Okay. It's 2018. A queen. Whatever. Um, what else comes to mind when you think about a king? Uh, a kingdom. A palace, right? What else? What else? Government. Government. I thought somebody would say sleeping beauty. Thank you for not saying that. But the, the, those are the things that come to mind. When you think about a kingdom, you think about a king. You think about a, a, a monarchy that sits as overall CEO, CEO of something. The next thing that comes to your mind is the territory that he is king of. Because you can't be a king without a territory. You need a domain. Kingdom, the dome, the, the, the space that you're in charge of. When you think about a kingdom, you also think about a constitution or somebody said government. The government, to be clear with you, educated city folk, is not the buildings on, what was the street where the build, government buildings are in Jakarta? I'm not a citizen, I don't need to know that. She does, she lives here. So, so the government is not the building or the people, it's the constitution, the beliefs and the laws and, and, and the regulations, that's government. So a kingdom has a king, it has a territory, it has rules and regulations or a constitution, but I want to add another more modern concept of a kingdom, in my opinion, it has a currency, it has a currency, that, that which it uses to trade, to buy and sell. So if Indonesia has the rupiah and if America has the dollar and if Britain, somebody said Great Britain, we don't use that expression anymore, we're not in the colonialism, just Britain, 
Okay, just Britain. Britain has the pound. Every kingdom seems to have a currency. So if I was to ask you an obvious question, what do you think is the currency of heaven? It, it, it's, in, it's implied in the theme of discussion. Love is heaven's currency that you must adopt. If, it's, it's a simple statement. Don't, don't overthink it. If you are a child of God, if you are a citizen of heaven, then it means you ought to follow the king that is Jesus. It means that you belong to the territory that is God's. And it means that you abide by the constitution, which is the word of God. And it also means you ought to trade using the currency of love. So when you come into this text, I want you to understand that obviously this is a parable. So there are certain rules to follow. And the rules are simply this. A parable has a running theme that is unique to that parable. And the theme in this particular parable is clear. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure, is like a merchant who buys a pearl of great price. So obviously, the parable is simply saying that the kingdom of heaven is worth something. The question is, what are you willing to pay in order to experience or become a citizen of that kingdom? The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. This man in this parable didn't go out looking for it. He happened to stumble on it by mistake. In the parable, Jesus illustrates using the events of those days. See, those days there were no safety deposit boxes. There were no banks. So the people had to uh, uh, keep their treasure safe. You couldn't keep it in your home because robbers would come and take it or during the times of war, they would loot and murder and steal and kill. And so what people would do, they would go into their fields or their neighbor's fields far and near, dig a hole and just bury the stuff in there. That's why even till today, there are certain sections of Palestine where they're still discovering buried treasures and buried wealth. Uh, in fact, in 2000 and 15 in 2015 in Caesarea they found 900 gold coins just below the surface on one of the beaches and the people that found it digged more until they found 2000 gold coins that somebody had tried to bury there are people who make a living digging up treasure and gold they're called treasure hunters there are people who invest all their savings to go into the oceans and various lands looking for buried treasure but this guy in the parable the bible says he discovered hidden treasure in a field he wasn't looking for it he just happened to stumble upon it now if the kingdom of heaven is salvation if it is eternal life if it if it is the grace of god if it is a gospel message is it possible that there are people who have stumbled into a relationship or an encounter with god that they were not thinking about yes or no are there people who have met Jesus when they were not looking for him? There are people who have had an encounter with Christ when they were not looking for him. But the point is, God is always looking for you. So when somebody says they found God, no, God found you. So in this parable, number one, the man stumbles on this treasure that is hidden in a field, and I call it a providential encounter. A providential encounter with God is a treasure many have been given but have not responded to. There are people who survived an accident. They know they should have died. They know they should have died. They've, they've been in situations where their life was in danger, but they survived. There are people who have had diseases that others have died from, but doctors have not been able to explain how the disease left them. They don't pray, they go, don't go to church, but God steps in. There are situations where your company has wanted to fire you, but beyond your imagination, you kept the job and you couldn't understand how. There are times when God has spoken to you. Don't go to this place. You, you just feel the hairs on your neck stand up and God says, take a left. And tomorrow in the newspaper, you hear that there was an accident right where you were supposed to be. 
Those are providential encounters with God and they are treasure. But here's the thing. In the parable, the man goes out, gets money, buys the, the land. But what if, what if he saw the treasure and said, oh, I don't need this drama and walked away? You would have thought you are a fool. How can you walk away from a chest full of treasure? But here's the thing. Millions, if not billions of people walk away from God when he comes knocking through providential encounter. Because they lack the currency of love. Here, here it is. The Bible says in his excitement. The King James says with joy. I love the New Living Translation. In his excitement. Why was he excited, Brother Irwan? Why was he excited? The guy who's in finance doesn't know why the man who found a bag of treasure was excited. He's excited because it's treasure. It's gold or emeralds or something. He's excited because he's thinking about what he can buy using that treasure. He's excited because he knows, I once was poor, but now I'm rich. So the question is, if the treasure is grace and if the treasure is salvation and if the treasure is the gospel or if the treasure is a relationship with God, then why should you be excited? There are a couple of things I can think of that a person can be excited about when they choose to buy the kingdom of heaven with love. You can expect a sense of freedom because when you accept the kingdom of heaven, it comes with a promise of freedom. You don't have to be a slave to sin no more. You don't have to be a slave to the opinions of other people no more. You don't have to hold yourself ransom simply because you don't see yourself as somebody that can be saved. There is nobody in this room right now who calls themselves a citizen of the kingdom of heaven but still feels ashamed when they come in the presence of God. It is impossible to call on the name of Jesus and not see your worth in the eyes of people. If you love Jesus, he will set you free. Amen, somebody. Amen. So if you are holding yourself ransom, you have not truly become a citizen. You are still a tourist. A sense of worth. It comes with being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. A sense of peace. Because now I am no longer ransomed to my sins. I am no longer ransomed to the devil. I am no longer ransomed to the ideals of the world. I have peace because Jesus is my king and I'm a citizen of his kingdom. Why? Because I paid with the currency of love. I believe it is uh, Isaiah chapter 5. If I'm not mistaken, pastors are allowed to forget verses now and again. The passage that talks about buying without money. There's a passage that says, come, buy, but you don't use money. It's free, but there's a price to pay. Do you know that salvation is free, but there is a, pi a price to pay? Listen to this. Being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven comes with a sense of possibilities. What lies ahead? That man was happy because he had gold. He had uh, a wealth at his uh, disposal. Wealth that he could use for himself. And he was thinking about the future. What I can buy and spend with that money. Why is it that God's people are not excited about being God's people? Why is it the long-faced lemon? You know when, when a child eats a lemon, that expression it makes? There are people who are like that in their relationship with God. Where has the excitement gone? Where is the excitement? You've lost it because you're no longer trading with the currency of love. Now you're trading with pride. You're trading with jealousy. You're trading with bitterness. You're trading with envy. And you wonder why you are not happy. Change the currency. Would somebody say amen? Notice the text says he was excited, but then he hid it again. Right? He found it, but he hid it again. Now, I want you to understand. Let's go back to, 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 to those days. If you walked into another man's field and for whatever reason stumbled upon wealth, in the, in the, in the code of honesty, you could not take that because it didn't belong to you. So what had to happen was you needed to own the land in order to own the treasure. And so this man finds it, looks around, makes sure that nobody saw him, 
puts it back where he found it, covers it up, goes home, and starts looking for all the things that he has that are valuable and discovers, I don't have enough money, I have to sell everything. And when he sells everything, he comes and he buys the field. Notice what he bought. He didn't buy the treasure, he bought the field. He didn't buy the treasure, he bought what? The field. Because he could afford the field, but he couldn't afford the treasure. But if he owned the field, guess who the treasure belongs to? But he hid it. Not because he was ashamed, but because he knew the value. So my question is, when you hide your relationship with Jesus, when you hide your faith, are you doing it because you're ashamed or because of its value? Don't answer me, just look at me the way you are right now with one eye almost closed. Do you hide your faith because it's valuable or because you're ashamed of it? It depends on the currency that you're using. You see how I'm forcing love into the text? See, this man loved that treasure so much, he was willing to sell everything he had. And he did. He hid it because he, it was valuable and he was willing to buy the land. It says he sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. The treasure was free, but the field was not. He paid for the field, but not the treasure. There's no amount of money that you can spend to buy the kingdom of heaven. That is not the point of the parable. The parable is not encouraging stewardship. The, the parable is not encouraging giving to the Lord. Oh no, it's trying to tell you that you must be willing to give up everything for the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes everything means anything worth trading with the currency of love. See, in the parable it says he sold everything, but the question is, what is everything to you? To you, everything can be the one thing that you love the most. That one thing that you're willing to give up to show that you love God. I, I appreciate the, example, uh, the examples that you brought up in our creative living slot. That the identity of the church after Jesus left was that people didn't give 10%. They gave everything. They, they sold their houses, their land. Do you understand that even in our generation, land is a, is a valuable commodity to own? Can you imagine then? It was even more because that was life. It was an, uh, an agricultural society. But they sold their land and said, there you go, preach the gospel. They understood that it wasn't the land that they were giving to God. It was their love that said, Lord, I love you more than I love what I have. I'm willing to give it up so that the kingdom of heaven can spread on earth. That was the success of the church then. It wasn't tithing, it was that they were trading with the currency of love. Somebody else say amen. amen. See, it's not complicated. We, we don't need seminars on stewardship and pastors busy making you feel bad for not giving. All you need to do is, if you love God, give. One pastor, interesting, this has got nothing to do with the sermon whatsoever. One pastor decided, you go on YouTube, you can just download pastor who doesn't believe in tithing. He decided he's not going to collect a tithe. And people are asking him, how are you going to sponsor the work? And he said, I'm going to appeal to their love. And I would love to suggest the same here, but <laughs> I, I, I know you guys. So, so he decided, I'm no longer collecting a tithe. I'm going to receive free will offering. And at the end of the year, he discovered he had collected more money from the free will offering than he did from tithing. I don't know whether it's because adults can be like kids. They don't like to be told what to do. They want to be asked. I don't know how it worked. But for some reason, the people were more willing to give out of love than out of obligation. So my question to you is, when you come to God's house, when you are in here worshiping and singing and, and doing what you do, are you trading from a currency of love or are you trading from a currency of favors and, and bribes and you're trying, to, you're trying to convince God, no, Lord, I love you. I'm here. I'm here. I love you. Or do you just love God and show it by sacrificing everything? Okay. Although salvation cannot be purchased, it will cost you all that you have. Some people, it has cost them their lives. But it's free, by the way. God doesn't charge you a red cent for salvation. But 
in order to fully experience it, it might require sacrificing the things you love the most. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. I looked at the text over and over again, and I realized that for a long time, in my mind, I thought the kingdom of heaven was the pearl. But I realized that's not, that's not what Jesus said. The kingdom of heaven is the experience that the merchant has in looking. The difference between these two parables is, in this one, he's actually looking for treasure. Are there people, question, are there people who go out looking for the Lord and find him? Yes or no? Yes. In both parables, they have an experience with the treasure. The one wasn't looking, but he found it by mistake. The other one was looking and he found it. The text says he was looking around for choice pearls. Somebody suggested that in the parables, the first one couldn't afford it. He couldn't afford it, so he wasn't looking for it. He stumbled upon it. So he was poor and he became rich. But in the second parable, this is somebody that's got money. He, he trades already. So he's got the money to buy it. But apparently he finds a particular pearl of great price beyond even what he has. And even he is willing to let go of it in order to buy it. It says he's on the lookout. I had to. I couldn't resist the urge to read from Christ Object Lessons. If you want to understand the parables of Jesus, pick up this book, Christ Object Lessons. Perfect explanations. In regard to the pearl of great price, this is what it says. There are some who seem to be always seeking for the heavenly pearl, but they do not make an entire surrender of their wrong habits. They do not die to self that Christ may live in them. Therefore, they do not find the precious pearl. Both parables, they discovered the treasure. Both parables, they decided it was worth sacrificing everything. Here is a sad statistic. Hundreds, thousands, millions, if not billions of people walk into worship places every Saturday and every Sunday. But not majority is willing to pay the price to receive that salvation. Everybody seated here, God forbid, everybody here is seeking for the precious pearl. But the question is, are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to give up everything in order to receive it? Pastor, what is everything? Everything is the currency of love. Love says, whatever I love more than God, I should be willing to let it go in order to receive this. So not, 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 not everybody that's looking for Jesus is willing to pay the price. Sometimes we are content with attendance. If the place is full, we're happy. But when heaven looks at this audience, it doesn't see chairs that are filled. God sees those who are willing to pay the price. And the currency is love. Here what it is. The kingdom is not a place. It's the process you go through to get to the place. That's why I said to you three years ago, don't seek after heaven. Seek after Jesus. Because if you have Jesus, he will lead you to the kingdom. Don't look for the kingdom, look for the king. Because when you find the king, he will give you access. Our problem is we want heaven. We want heaven. And so we don't stay long in church because guess what? It's not heaven. The devil comes to church. So look for Jesus. And he'll give you the keys to the kingdom. Would somebody say amen? I'm, 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 I hope you're getting it. Love is not in the text, but it's the currency. It's what we use to trade with. It says a merchant on the lookout, when he discovered a pearl of great value, this man intentionally went looking for God, but he still had to respond when he found him. He found the pearl. He had to decide, okay, uh, I, I, I'm a merchant. I'm a businessman. Uh, I have a family, but I really want this pearl. It says he sold everything in order to have it. He was willing to give it up. He sold everything he owned. Listen to the statement. The worth and value of something is determined by what you choose to see. In the first statement I said, the worth and value of something is based on the fact that you are willing to pay the price no matter what it is. Now I'm changing the statement to say, the worth and value of something is determined by what you choose to see. There's a box with shoes inside. I asked my wife a question yesterday. I'm going to ask you. Two scenarios. Okay, two, two 
is the word scenario, okay? Two experiences. You walk into a department store, ladies, and you go up to the clerk and you say to them, I called last week and I put an order for a pair of shoes. And then the clerk says to you, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is the shoes are available. The bad news is we don't have the box. Would you still buy the shoes? Yes or no? Yes. Uh, Pastor Henry would buy the female shoes as well. <laughs> Second scenario, you walk into the same store and the clerk says, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is we have the box. The bad news is we don't have the shoes. <laughs> would you still pay the price? It's a silly illustration, but here's the problem. When people look at the kingdom of heaven, they're looking at the box. They are looking at what they are going to give up. They are looking at the things they are going to lose, but nobody ever looks inside for the benefits. So we are not willing to pay the price because all we see is a box. I hope all of you see shoes. I hope none of the ladies are like, honey, please buy me those shoes. I don't even know what brand that is. That's Ray something. Nobody cares. Christ Object Lessons, page 118. Christ, the heavenly merchant man, seeking goodly pearls, saw in lost humanity the pearl of price. In man, defiled and ruined by sin, he saw the possibilities of redemption. I love that uh, double uh, explanation of the parable. See, the kingdom of heaven is not just a merchant man, a ma humanity going out to look for Christ. See, the, the pearl represents Jesus. Because if you have the pearl, you have access. But in this uh, statement, it's telling us that in actual fact, you are the pearl. Sinful and lost and messed up as we are, when God sees us, he sees a pearl that needs to be polished and cleaned. Obviously, when we look at each other, we don't see pearls, we just see annoying people. But when Jesus looks at us, he's like, ah, that's a precious soul. What did Jesus pay using to buy the precious pearl of humanity? He used his blood, his sweat, and his tears. Basically, the currency of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, we respond with the same currency of love, and we say, Lord, I love you enough to give up the world. But the problem is, we don't have the capacity to receive the love of God. Why? Because there's conflict between our love for God and our love for the world. The solution is, start buying with the currency of love. God doesn't care how much you preach, how much you sing, how much you give, how much you serve, how many poor people you give money to. The question is, were you motivated by love? That is the currency. When it comes to the currency of love, Jesus has paid more than we will ever have to. Beloved, that is my interpretation and understanding of those parables. Those men, those, the merchant and the ordinary citizen who discovered treasure, both of them had one thing in common. Even though one stumbled on by mistake, the other was looking for it, they had one thing in common. They were willing to give everything in order to receive the treasure. What are you willing to give? In case you don't know. See, when somebody, so, so a young lady came to me about five Sabbaths ago. Uh, she's, not, she's not a member of the church. She said to me, Pastor, are you willing to die for your sheep? I said, no, I'm not. Are you willing to die for Christ? I said, I don't know. But what I do know is I love God. I, if you ask me, am I willing to die for what I believe? I am not sure. I'm not sure about my capacity, but what I do know is I love God enough to wait upon the test to come. So don't focus on whether you can die for God. Don't focus on whether you're willing to lose your job for what you believe. Focus on filling up your capacity for love. That will determine whether you can stand or not. Do you see the, the paradigm shift? Don't focus on, oh Lord, I don't think I can separate with 10% of my salad. No, focus on, Lord, I love you enough to give you everything. Love is the currency. Love is a currency. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Amen, somebody. Amen. Lord, increase my capacity for love. Lord, help me deal with the conflict that I have between my love for the world and my love for Jesus. Lord, give me the heart that is willing to give up everything for the kingdom of heaven. 
If that's your prayer this afternoon, I invite you to stand with me. Uh, this is the place I've chosen to end the series on. These two men were willing to give up everything, but we're not talking about money. We're not talking about gold or silver or diamonds. We are talking about a relationship with Jesus that gives you ultimate access. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Dear Father, I hope and pray that in the approach I have chosen to attack this text, I hope that I have not gone beyond the scope of hermeneutical rules. But what I do understand, Lord, is that the kingdom of heaven is not just a place. It's the experience that we can have with Jesus down here. So before we focus on the material things we are willing to give up for the Lord, help us, Lord, to focus on our capacity to receive love from you. Because whatever we receive, we will be willing to give. That is why Jesus chose to die for us while we were sinners. He wanted to make sure that there was access to the love of God. Because if God can love us first, all we have to do is respond. Lord, some of us have been trading in our relationships, in our partnerships and marriages. We've been trading with the currency of hate. We've been trading with the currency of disrespect. Even in the church, we've been trading with the currency of favor and the currency of who matters more than the other. In our work, we've been trading with the currency of bribes and the currency of favor and who knows who. But Father, today we are asking you, teach us to trade with the currency of love. To love God unconditionally. To love our brothers and sisters enough that we would forgive them over and over and over again. But most of all, give us the hearts to trade with the currency of love. To remain faithful until Jesus comes again. And now I pray, may the Lord be above you to watch over you. May the Lord be beneath you to lift you up when you fall. May the Lord be by your side as a friend. May the Lord surround you to protect you until the end. May the Lord walk ahead of you to guide you in the way. May the Lord walk behind you that you would never go astray. But above all things, may the Lord be in your hearts that you might be like Jesus and trade with the currency of love. In his wonderful name, let everyone say amen and amen. God bless you. You may take your seats. Thank you for enduring the message. Next week, we start new series. Next week, we experience new new things. Right now we will collect our offerings and the tithes and remember, uh, don't just trade in the currency of the amount you're giving. Trade with the currency of love as you give. Let us pray. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to give from a place of love. Love for you. Love for the gospel. Love for the ministry of the gospel. Love for your church. Love for the leaders and the pastors and the people that we support to do this work. May we give with a global perspective and may we give from a love place in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. day to night and watches me as I begin to dream Jesus it is you who brings me food from my table who cares for all of my needs Who walks the road with me, his crown with me through all that I have been. Jesus, it is you. Jesus, it is you.
So I lift my hands And I bring my soul All of my days All of my rights All of my wrongs I offer my life Here and beyond To the one thing true, Jesus, see this you. Everyone who knows the song, let's sing together. Who sees my brokenness and carries me when I am frail and weak, Jesus, it is you. Who tells the storm to rest when I am overwhelmed and cannot speak? Jesus, it is you. Who wears my guilt on his shoulders? Who holds my heart? Who holds my heart in his hand? Who takes my thoughts and fears and hands them on the arms of Calvary? Jesus, it is you. Jesus, it is you. We lift our hands so I live my hands and I.